Is my mic working? So first of all, I'd just like to thank the Linda Hall Library and its wonderful staff for hosting me here for about three months now. Um, as mentioned, I did my undergrad at the University of Kansas, so it's great to be back nearby. Um, and thank you all for braving the, the weather outside uh, and, and showing up. It's nice to see some familiar faces. Um, so yeah, so this talk today, it's a, it will be a, an overview of my research um, and we'll touch on, on various different themes that I've addressed in my dissertation, which I'm now working on making into a book. Um, and what I want to just start by, by talking about is a little bit just a question that, that came up a lot as I was working on my dissertation. A lot of people asked me that and it is, uh, what's the point of balloons? What are they good for? And as I said, a lot of people ask me that. Uh, after all, in the popular imagination, ballooning is seen as something pretty lighthearted and frivolous. It's an expensive hobby that draws eccentric balloonists and curious tourists to Albuquerque every fall for the world's largest ballooning fiesta. And yeah, this is a photo that I actually took a few years back. And that. Um, and it's a one-time romantic adventure on which couples can spend their savings attempting to preserve the experience with photos of champagne glasses and panoramic views on Instagram. And I literally just typed in romantic balloon trip on Instagram and all these photos showed up. Um, and finally, there's the occasional oddball who ties some helium balloons to a chair, a practice known as cluster ballooning. There's a it's actually, there are a lot of enthusiasts, well, not a lot, but there are a few enthusiasts. And this drives the media into a frenzy. And here you have an example of that. But in 19th century France, which is the period that I research, and the area that I research, ballooning was serious business. When I was starting this project, I visited the Library of Congress, which houses the Tissandier collection on the history of aeronautics. And I visited there because I was fairly nearby, and I just wanted to get a better picture of how ballooning uh, fit into the broader culture of the time. And one particular artifact caught my attention among the 8,000 items collected by Albert and Gaston Tissandier, two brothers who were major figures in the French aeronautical community at the time. It was a beige, as you can see, worn out, rectangular piece of fabric. A handwritten caption uh, read, fabric from the Armand Barbès balloon. And this was the balloon in which Léon Gambetta escaped from the siege of Paris. And I'll get to that shortly. But Gambetta, I should say, had just become Minister of Interior of the new Republican government after Napoleon III, who had been the first Napoleon's nephew, capitulated to the Prussians in 1870. And I found it very resonant that Albert and Gaston had made an effort to secure a piece of this balloon and add it to their collection. So I already knew that, um, that for the two brothers, ballooning was serious business, because as I browsed through the collection, I discovered that they had organized a number of scientific ascents and had even built their own airship. But as I looked at that souvenir from the Armand Barbès, and it dawned on me that for them, ballooning represented much more. It was a way of life and a source of meaning. It defined their identity and served as a prism through which they made sense of the world. So what I want to do today is offer you a glimpse of how that worldview took form. I'm not here to make the case that balloons are a wonderfully useful technology and that we are fools for not investing more on it. I don't have to make that case because actually there are a lot of people, there are a good number of people investing on it, um, for instance, tethered aerostats that flow as, float as high as 10,000 feet carrying a surveillance radar are an important component of the security apparatus in the U.S.-Mexico border. And they have been especially useful in reducing the number of low-flying aircraft smuggling drugs into the country. Meanwhile, Alphabet Inc., which is uh, Google's parent company, has been working on Project Loon, um, uh, a joking name, of course, uh, Project Loon, which seeks to use high-altitude balloons to provide internet to remote areas. So instead, what I want to do is give you a bird's eye view, pun intended, of how the balloon went from being an exciting technology in the years following its invention in 1783 
to becoming a subject of jokes in the mid-19th century, only to be rediscovered as, a, as modern again in the last third of that century. So, in our world of self-checkout machines and self-driving cars, it is very easy to fall into a trap of technological determinism and depict inventions as taking a life of their own. In short, as a lot of people see it, a way that I don't necessarily agree, Tesla and Spotify are modern and symbols of the future. Meanwhile, the local trolley and vinyl records are obsolete relics for tourists and hipsters. It might be counterintuitive, but my brief panorama will be a history of innovation, even if the balloon barely changed in that century. I hope that this history of ballooning will show how an old artifact can become modern based on social, cultural, and political processes, and prompt you to think about how ideas of obsolescence are culturally constructed. But let me move from telling you what the talk is about to showing you what I mean. And just a quick note before I get started, uh, I've been here for three months, <laughs> and I've been able to go through some wonderful material at the library, and you'll be able to see some of that during the talk. Anything that has this, uh, this icon, this logo attached to it, is something that I, I, I looked at here at the library itself. Okay, so let's get started. So the balloon made its deb debut on June 4th, 1783, in Anone a town in southern France. On that rainy day, a crowd gathered in the town square as workers built a scaffold and suspended a large bag of sackcloth between two poles. Then, the brothers Joseph and Etienne Montgolfier placed a brazier underneath the bag's gaped bottom. The bag started swelling and acquired the shape of a, gold, of a globe. Realizing that the moment had arrived, Etienne ordered the workers to release the ropes. The bag sh shot up more than 3,000 feet, and winds carried it to a nearby vineyard, where the brazier tipped over upon touching ground and set fire to the fabric. <laughs> the entire apparatus burned, but the demonstration was deemed a success. success. And here you have an early print uh, of that, that moment with the balloon taken off. Reports of the experiment quickly reached Paris where the Academy of Sciences appointed a commission to study the matter and requested a demonstration in the capital. A public subscription was opened to finance the ascent of a balloon made by Paris's most popular lecturer on physics, Jacques-Alexandre Charles. Charles believed that he was simply replicating de Montgolfier's initial experiment, but in fact, he had developed a different method. Instead of hot air, the same mechanism that, that you usually see in tourist balloons, Instead of hot air, his balloon relied on hydrogen, which had just recently been discovered as well. <coughs> at 3 p.m. on June 27th, ticket holders were allowed within the enclosure set up at the Champ de Mars, where the Eiffel Tower now stands. The common people who had not been able to afford a ticket searched for places around the area to watch the spectacle. Finally, at 5 p.m., a cannon fired and the balloon was released. Among those who saw it fly away was Benjamin Franklin. After hearing someone question the apparatus's utility, the American polymath apparently quipped back, well, what is the use of a newborn baby? Whether or not Franklin actually said those words is unresolved amongst the scholarly community, uh, but they captured, but people said that he said that back then. So these words actually captured the anxieties that weighed over the spectacular invention. These two ascents were soon followed by a number of firsts. On September 19th, the first living beings, a sheep, a duck, and a rooster, why a sheep, a duck, and a rooster is also not clear, <laughs> became airborne aboard a balloon set off before the king and queen in Versailles. November 21st marked the first human flight. Then, on ja January 7th, 1785, Jean-Pierre Blanchard and John Jeffries flew from Dover to Pas-de-Calais, thus marking the first flight across the English Channel. As these events unfolded, ballooning became all the rage in France. A sense in Paris might have drawn as much as half the city's population, and ballooning made its way into conversation, poems, plays, illustrations, and more. The balloon also became a prevalent mo motif in clothing and f furniture, 
thus embedding itself in the 18th century's burgeoning consumer, consumer culture. And actually, a lot of these items uh, are on display at the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum. So you have here the folding fan with the, the balloon iconography and ceramic plates featuring balloons were actually a really big deal at the time. So, and these items were so prevalent that the expression folie de ballon or balloon craze became commonplace in France. And this obsession is explained by what the technology seemed to promise. After all, the dream of flight had haunted humanity for millennia. Everyone made predictions about how balloons were, would, would revolutionize commerce and warfare once people figured out how to steer them against the wind. The Academy of Sciences itself, that hallowed institution full of respectable men, directed an unprecedented amount of energy into studying the technology. But this enthusiasm was very much short-lived. Discussion of balloons in the halls of the Academy peaked in early 1784, slumped dramatically after June of that same year, and essentially disappeared by mid-1785. Furthermore, authorities grew concerned with the risks associated with ascents, from fire damage posed by a landing to the riots sparked by failed ascents. And there had actually been a couple of riots where police shot into crowds, killing a couple of people, and it became uh, somewhat controversial to, to, to do a balloon ascent. So ordinances regulating ballooning popped up everywhere, very much like you see ordinances regulating drone ascents nowadays. Um, so basically what I want to get, the point I want to get across is that the balloon entered the years after the 1789 French Revolution. So keep in mind, this is only six years after the balloon was invented, burdened by an ambiguous status. It carried a hefty symbolic charge, since it was a product of French genius, but it was originated in what would come to be known as the old regime. The most generous sponsors of the activity had been at the head of that, the old guard, people like the king and his family. So it is not surprising that Jean-Paul Marat, a vociferous critic of the old order that called for just about everyone to be guillotined, attacked those early aeronauts for being greedy entertainers who had taken bread from the mouths of the poor. But revolutionaries also knew that the balloon's spectacular quality had a political use, and they incorporated a sense into their festivals. They also experimented with balloons in a military context. The revolution ushered scores of men of science into politics and they did their best to bring science in the service of their idealistic project. In 1794, officials created a ballooning unit that saw action in the Battle of Fleureuse, where for the first time, a balloon was put into military use. And here you have a contemporary print of that event, the, balloon, the tethered balloons here, right? Reports were divided on its usefulness, on whether it actually offered a better strategic vision of the battle, but officials followed suit by creating a second unit and establishing a national balloon school near Paris. By the end of 1795, another balloon unit had been created, and together they featured a force of 120 men. But here's the thing, military, the military can be pretty conservative, uh, not just in France, but everywhere. And by 1799, military conservatism had prevailed. The balloon units were disbanded and the school closed. Napoleon, who came into power later that year, and this is the first Napoleon, the one we all know, um, had showed some interest in recruiting a balloon for his Italian campaign. But he concluded that the bulky apparatus was not appropriate for his speedy style of warfare. warfare. With that, the revolution's experiment with military balloons came to an end. In the years that followed, the French government retreated from any kind of flirtation with aeronautical matters. From the early 1800s to 1870, the various French reg regimes received more than 100 proposals claiming to have designed machines capable of aerial navigation. The response was always the same. The government had, could not offer any kind of help. Anyone who sought to conduct an experiment had to find a way to finance it himself. And the path usually chosen was that of public subscriptions. At the same time, the structures for a more institutionalized Parisian ballooning scene were emerging. The managers of the pleasure gardens turned to ballooning as they competed for audiences in search of distraction after the grave years of the, the revolution. 
and aeronauts made their ascents increasingly spectacular. On a given weekend in the, in the summer of 1817, for instance, Parisians could choose between watching Mademoiselle Elise Garnerin parachute from a balloon or Monsieur Margat ascend while mounted on a doe, an actual doe. Uh, here's an ad for that <laughs> particular ascent. Garnerin and Margat were represented, and here's a, this print actually shows Garnerin ma making one of her um, parachute attempts. These two people were actually representative as representatives of an emerging professional ballooning class. Professional aeronauts were responsible for almost 80% of all ascents made in the first half of the 19th century. And by professional aeronauts, I mean those people who identify themselves, like this is their way of living, not some wealthy nobleman who wants to go on an ascent, for instance. One of the defining features of this class was the very visible role played by women. Not a single woman featured amongst the six professional aeronauts working between 1783 and 1802. But from 1803 to 1848, they were 20 out of the 50 new professional practitioners. This relative gender balance in the profession's early years is explained by the fact that ballooning was a family affair dominated by dynasties that jealously passed on their know-how to younger generations. Famous female professional aeronauts included not only the aforementioned Elisa, but also Louise Poitevin and Sophie Blanchard, pictured here, and who was probably the most famous aeronaut, male or female, of her era. And she actually died in a dramatic fashion in 1819 when she plunged to the ground after launching some fireworks that put fire to her balloon. And that was a common form of entertainment at the time. Um, again, trying to make it more and more spectacular, right? During a period when official institutions showed little interest, these women and their families were critical in passing the knowledge necessary to manufacture and maneuver balloons, and they helped train subsequent generations of aeronauts. Meanwhile, the type of person who worked on developing steerable balloons was almost always, some, was almost always someone from a modest background and without any scientific training. An exemplary case of this phenomenon was Ernest Pétain, a, human, a, a humble Parisian clothesmaker. In 1849, Pétain ca caused quite a stir in Paris by claiming that he had invented what he called an aerostatic locomotive. The airship he designed was, and this is the airship, the airship he designed was um, 70 meters long and featured four connected balloons. He claimed that it could transport 500 people at speeds up to 125 miles per hour. Pétain stated that he needed 100,000 francs to build a machine. I, I know what you're thinking, right? <laughs> and opened a national subscription. He managed to manufacture three of the balloons and actually lended them to different entertainers. But in September of 1851, he announced that he was not getting enough money and would take his invention abroad. In search of new subscribers, he left for England, followed by the United States, and then Mexico, each time trying to get more and more subscriptions. So I know it's easy to laugh, but it doesn't seem like he actually profited from his subscriptions. He actually put all his money into the invention. And, while, and it seems like he was actually uh, an earnest believer in his project, because he died in 1878, living his final years in the charity of a brother, brother who prohibited him from busying himself with balloons. Another failed project, this one more farcical than Pétain, I'd say, was the De La Marne balloon, this one here. In the mid-1860s, De La Marne made headlines claiming to have found a definite solution to steering. In May 1866, he sold tickets for a demonstration, and the press claimed that 100,000 Parisians came to watch. But when the balloon took off, it was evident that De La Marne had no control over it and the crowd's anxious hope quickly turned into mockery. The following is a quote from a reporter. From far away, the balloon looked like a giant potato wearing a dressing gown, <laughs> swinging with the grace of an elephant dancing on a rope. Whether Delamain believed in his project or was a swindler is beside the point. In the tribunal of public opinion, he, was, he came off as the, as the latter. But crowds still continue to gather to watch balloon ascents. After all, they're fun to watch. 
Um, but by the mid-1860s, the Globes no longer inspired much faith in the triumph of man over the winds or in, or in progress. Uh, they were no longer really a symbol of progress. This 1862 lithograph by Edouard Manet, the Impressionist painter, can be read as conveying the morose state of aeronautics. The Goya-esque Le Ballon depicts the festive use of ballooning during the Second Empire. One and so I want you to pay attention. So you have the balloon here, and you have this, this boy here. And he's actually a legless boy on a, on a cart, uh, a fairly common an urban type, to say. And what I want to point out is that one could read Manet's decision to line the balloon up with the legless boy in the foreground as conveying his staunch republicanism, because uh, Manet was a very stern critic of the, the Napoleonic Empire, with the arrangement ironically commenting on the grim reality of warfare that the celebration of Napoleon III's imperial ambitions chose to ignore. But if social politically, the juxtaposition of the balloon with the legless boy easy, easily lends itself to a relationship of contrast, I'd actually say that technologically, it may very well be intended as one of analogy. The balloon, although surrounded by people, some paying attention, others just there for the party. Um, the balloon, so the balloon is, um, it's no better than the ignored child. It's a crippled machine that never fully developed. This was how Gustave Flaubert, one of Manet's contemporaries, uh, who wrote Madame Bovary and all those books, depicted the technology in a satirical compendium of bourgeois platitudes, what he called the Dictionary of Received Ideas. In the two entries under Balloon, the cynical realist illustrated the chasm between what Balloons had initially promised and what they delivered. First came a utopian statement. With balloons, we will end up going to the moon. Then, a, cyber, uh, a bitingly sober response. We are nowhere near steering them. So this is stru structured like the dictionary, right? Number one, with balloons, we're, we'll end up going to the moon. Number two, we're nowhere near steering them. But here, something interesting happens. In July 1870, France and Prussia went into war. In just a couple of months, the Prussians had forced Napoleon III's surrender in Sedan. But this caused a cu curious turn, turn of events. The emperor's surrender emboldened Republicans to overthrow his regime. On September 4th, Parisians took to the streets to celebrate after Léon Gambetta, who I mentioned earlier, proclaimed the Republic. Troops marched down avenues singing the Marseillaise, the French, what today is the French national anthem and Republican icons like Victor Hugo returned from exile. The defeat at Sedan sparked a feverish Republican nationalism, and the provisional government issued proclamations calling for the defense of the Republic and, quote, a fight to death against the invader. In short, the regime change and the burst of patriotic resistance threw a wrench into the usual script of warfare, transforming the conflict that could have been resolved by signing a treaty into an existential contest. But the French army was in shambles, and soon enough, the Prussians laid siege to Paris, isolating the capital from the rest of the world. The situation must have been especially offensive to Victor Hugo, who in an essay celebrating the 1867 World's Fair, exalted the radiance of Paris as a beacon to humanity. And this is a map showing the Paris... It, this was no easy feat, because as this map shows... Uh, so this is the core of Paris, so this is touristy Paris, right? And this line right here is actually how far the defenses extended. Not only was there a wall with, with moat and all that, but there were also a variety of different forts. So the Prussians, they, they did good there. Um, and this siege actually lasted four months. And all the turmoil that has, had marked sieges since the age of castles, from boredom to hunger, plagued Parisians. Horse meat, which was relatively common with the lower classes, became a staple of the food economy. By late October, cats and dogs were being sold on the streets to eat, not for pets. In mid-November, the food situation was serious enough for rat prices to double in two days. Elites even engaged in gastronomic safaris, eating a variety of zoo animals, including a pair of elephants uh, that were very celebrated. 
at the time. And this, uh, this painting is actually, yeah, it shows one of those street vendors preparing a rat, like butchering a rat, right? So not a, a pretty bleak situation, but something else was going on too. As soon as the war bro broke out, some Parisians started mobilizing to put balloons into use. In particular, the famous photographer, some of you might have heard of him, Nadar, created an, an, an unofficial military ballooning unit to observe the Prussian offensive. But here's the thing, the empire's bureaucracy, so before Napoleon fell at Sedan, Napoleon III fell at Sedan, the empire's bureaucracy had hardly budged to encourage these initiatives. So Nadar ended up setting up his balloon observation station at the top of Montmartre, uh, which then became home to the Moulin Rouge and all that, only after the proclamation of the new republic. And here you have his, his little ballooning station with little tents for his troops. Because the rise of balloons above Parisi the Parisian skyline began with the establishment of the new regime, people associated one thing to the with the other. Nadar immediately started producing aerial reports that again were of questionable strategic usefulness. But in his first report, he also he brought up another use, a potential use for balloons. They could be useful for communications. So the first successful flight across the Prussian Iron Belt happened on September 23rd. Jules Duruf, one of those marginalized entertainment balloonists, ascended aboard the Neptune with several bags of mail. As he took off, he shouted out, Vive la République! When the balloon flew over the city walls, Duruf noticed the Prussians. They aimed their artillery, but the projectiles, projectiles could not reach the balloon. Carried by the wind, the Neptune landed, landed near Evreux, a town 60 miles west of Paris, where de Reux fulfilled his mission by delivering the mail. With that, the provisional government made the balloon post official, and the city's two major train stations, the Gare du Nord and the Gare d'Orléans, were made into balloon factories. Women, played a key, again, played a key role in the process, especially at the Gare d'Orléans, where about 100 female workers meticulously hand sued the envelopes. Duroff's de departure was a spectacle that reached far more people than the crowd that came to see him take off in Montmartre. For in floating through the sky, the balloon caught the eyes of Parisians throughout the city. A writer for Le Figaro described how, quote, many tender eyes follow this new kind of messenger. In every street of the capital, in every intersection, up and down the boulevards, curious masses pointed, out, pointed it out to the crowd. And it was only at 9 a.m. when it had disappeared into space that the groups dispersed. And here you have a, a painting that, it, this one actually shows the departure of uh, Gambetta, the prime minister, uh, who would be, then become the prime minister abo aboard his, bal uh, his balloon. And he actually departed in order to try to coordinate um, uh, logistics with the provisional government that had relocated to another city in France. Um, and the, one po the point I'm trying to get across is that during this moment of crisis, what happened is that the balloon became a kind of emotive technology on which Parisians placed their hopes. Um, I, I had a chance to read through several, not several, a lot of these letters. Uh, and they'll make references to the balloon and make sort of write may my best wishes be carried in the air. So, so there's, this, there's this sort of fusion of their emotions with the, new, the, the technology. And here's the thing, there were plenty of these ascents. From September 19th to January 28th, 65 man balloons successfully departed from Paris, an average of one balloon every other day. They transported a variety of correspondence, letters, newspapers, official dispatches, plus the occasional special cargo, like photographic or scientific equipment. The balloons were deemed so important that the government cut gas to private residences so that it could be preserved to inflate the globes. And this is dead in the winter, actually one of the coldest winters uh, in, in, in the 19th century. Parisians and people all over the world read with, read with interest descriptions of these ascents. A series of tropes structure these accounts. Emotional goodbyes and cheers from spectators as the balloon departed Paris, 
a barrage of fire as it flew over Prussian lines, the flight over the provinces, an adventurous landing, and finally, a warm reception by peasants who ushered aeronauts and mail to safety before the Prussians arrived. These narratives constructed the balloon service as the most redeeming French effort in what was otherwise a humiliating war, for aeronauts could claim a substantial degree of success and capitalize on their dangerous ascents to constru construct an image of selfless bravery. And here's an example of one of these, these narratives, um, again, uh, that I actually found here at the Linda Hall Library. Um, and yes, actually this one has narratives from all the 65 ascents. And this map here shows where all the balloons ended up landing. Two of them were actually lost at sea and the, with the men dying. Uh, one of them landed in Norway. Um, so <laughs> again, pretty impressive. So after the war, research into aeronautical matters acquired new urgency fostering an identification between scientific ballooning and French republicanism. Following a trope that had originated back in the 18th century and resurged in the late 19th century, the aeronaut Wilfred de Fonville argued that France would do well to concentrate its efforts in conquering the empire of the air, since the empire of the seas clearly belonged to Britain. And the recently unified Germany overpowered the French on land. Bonneville also argued that associations were needed to accumulate knowledge and called for an, a, quote, aeronauts club, where all the members would have to go, would have to do at least one untethered ascent. As it turns out, at this moment, pieces were coming together for the emergence of the French Society for Aerial Navigation, or what I'll refer to now, from now on as the FSAN. France's most important aeronautical organization until the appearance of the Aero Club de, Aero Club de France in the late 1890s. So, the FSAN was established in 1872 with the goal of making aeronautical pursuits more scientific. The society's journal, L'Aeronaut, would disseminate knowledge, while knowledge production was controlled through a two-tiered membership structure. Deliberative powers were exclusive to initiated members, a status acquired only after, quote, achieving scientific notoriety or producing at least one serious work, end quote. The remaining members were associates that could attend meetings but had only a, con this word always tricks me, consulta consultative, consultative voice. Entry to either tier required one to go through a strict, strict admissions procedure. The changes helped the FSAN foster a more disciplined scientific identity. Previous societies featured members from all different kinds of backgrounds, with men of science or engineers in the minority. But by 1875, the FSAN's membership was obviously more scientific. 31.6% of them worked in the sciences, 20% were engineers, and 10.5% were in the military. Furthermore, important political, scientific, and military names were amongst the society's leadership. Its presidents included the famous astronomer Jules Janssen and Paul Burt, a professor at the Sorbonne and an influential deputy. Just as important, the FSAN featured in its ranks one of the men I mentioned at the start of my talk, Gaston Tissandier. In 1873, Gaston started the peri periodical La Nature to, spread Nature to spread scientific knowledge and faith in progress amongst the French. The strategy he developed to popularize science and technology involved instructing while also entertaining by having his publication richly illustrated. And if you ever get to put your hands on one of those, it's, 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 it's awesome. Every article comes with like different diagrams. It's, 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 it's very original. La Nature started out with a circulation of 2,000, and in the following years grew to be France's preeminent popularizer of science, reaching a print run of 15,000 by 1885. This might not seem like much, but keep in mind, this was a time when people used libraries more than what we do now, and they went to libraries to, to read magazines and, and there'd be reading cabinets. And actually among its readers was Jules Verne, 
who would read a copy in his local library. And if you actually go through Jules Verne's, Jules Verne's papers, you see that he, get a lot, he gets a lot of the information for his novels from this, this actual magazine. So Gaston, who is featured here as a, in a caricature on a balloon, and he's actually throwing out issues of La Nature to the crowd. His multiple roles as man of the press, dabbler in science, and aeronaut did much to spread the importance of ballooning to a broader French audience. So, as the FSAN build, built boundaries to protect its scientific identity, it also found channels through which aeronautical developments could be disseminated to the broader public. And there were other occasions to spread aeronautical knowledge, occasions colored by a patriotic Republican hue. Bonneville was also a prolific writer and very active in the conference circuit. He lectured on a variety of scientific topics, from the metric system to physics, but his focus was aeronautics. These events usually brought in hundreds of men and women from all social classes, spectators who listened to a scientific lecture infused with Republican propaganda. For example, at a talk titled The Great Aerial Dramas, Von Ville harshly attacked the previous imperial regime for causing aeronautics to stagnate for 20 years and confidently stated that, quote, only the Republic could permit the aeronautical art to vigorously soar. Yeah, and I think his pun was also intended. <laughs> Associating the Republican form of government with aeronautics became a thriving trope in the years after the Franco-Prussian War. But even with all the patriotic sentiments associated with Balloon, it was still not clear how they could be put to practical use. After all, with no siege in place, it was once again more efficient to send mail by land instead of, well, risking it land in Norway, as had happened. The solution to steering remained a pipe dream. So FSAN leaders argued that as people patiently waited for it, they should make inquiries into, quote, more immediate applications of aeronautics. Reading through the speeches published in L'Aeronaute gives one a clearer understanding of the rhetorical strategies used to maintain enthusiasm for a technology that had been anticipated for a century, but, th but that showed little signs of manifesting itself. Through their words and their actions, FSAN members sought to legitimize something that for decades had been the province of opportunists and cranks. And actually, one of the things, they, they actually made a, a no analogies to um, uh, alchemy, uh, explaining how like alchemists work on trying to find, find gold, uh, transform substances into gold, and even though they never succeeded in doing that, they they discovered a bunch of different things. So that's that's pretty interesting because alchemists were actually also a marginalized community in the early modern period. So what did the FSAN do? It turned to using balloon to study the atmosphere and establishing measurement standards that could map this unknown region of the world. These were primarily manned ascents, but this work set the foundation to the sounding balloons that Gustave Hermite, right, shown right here, uh, developed in the 1890s, a practice that led to the discovery of the stratosphere. In fact, sounding balloons continue to be a critical component of our weather services, with meteorologists launching about 1,600 of them each and every day. Just as important, the FSAN helped cultivate a new image of the aeronaut, that of the self-sacrificing man of science who risked his life by ascending to the higher limits of the atmosphere in order to extract hard data from nature. And this is obviously a, a a mytholo mythologized, mythical view of science, right? Um, that is represented here by these three guys. But at the same time, they're, they, they're positioning themselves, oh, we're going up in the air and extracting this data. This right here is actually uh, one of the ways they collected this data. They would throw out these sheets from the balloon and ask whoever encountered them to fill up information, like what the what was the wind speed, what, where they saw the balloon, what was the temperature like. Uh, and these were found by all kinds of people, including, including a beggar, a uh, gardener. And these were people who helped construct science at the time. They were erased from the official publications, right? They, they never mentioned that the data that they collect were, was collected by these people, but the boundaries between science and the public are not impermeable. Um, 
so, but the, this image of the 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 aeronaut as this self-sacrificing man of science is very much was very much real at the time. Uh, so actually, this this depicts a high altitude ascent, and two of these men ended up dying. Uh, during this ascent, after reaching from la from lack of oxygen, after reaching more than 28,000 feet, and after that, after they, uh, Tissandier was actually the one who survived, and and during the funeral of these two other men, uh, Croce Spinelli and Civil, thousands of Parisians f did a, a cortege, followed the casket around. Uh, and politicians, the press, highbrow poets, and lowbrow musicians associated their martyrdom with the sacrifice of the soldiers who had perished in the battlefield during the Franco-Prussian War. So another one of the tropes at the time was that Prussia had won the war because it was more advanced in technology and science, and these were people who were actually trying to help France catch up, with, catch up and pass Prussia. So they were just as heroic as the, the soldiers who perished in the field. So for many, scientific ballooning became a vector in which the patriotic heroism shown during the war and a progress-minding ideology could fuse together and propel Republican France into a glorious future. After the positive experience with the balloons, so I'm going to move to another stage now, and you'll see. After this positive experience during the siege and with their use of, in the production of atmospheric science, Ballooning was no longer just associated with marginalized entertainments and unscrupulous speculators. It had become something respectable again. This meant that the balloon was free to be appropriated by the higher echelons of French society. These elite practitioners came together to form the Aero Club de France, associating ballooning with a masculine sporting culture that drew extensive attention from the press around the world. Just as important, Aero Club members set up committees and encouraged wealthy patrons to offer prizes for challenges that might promote technological innovation, elements that structured aeronautical culture in the years preceding World War I, not only with balloons, but also with airplanes. So, about the Aero Club. In the late 19th century, one of the ways French elites found to differentiate themselves from the growing middle classes was by developing increasingly elaborate and expensive forms of leisure. Ultimately, this and this is actually uh, a moment in time where there's a revival of the of dueling. Um, fencing gets really popular, and the people who are doing this are all like the, these members of the aristocracy. Ultimately, this politics of leisure and distinction started to transform ballooning too. To take just one example, in 1894, Fonville went on a balloon excursion sponsored by the mag magazine Journal de Voyage. For six days, and this is from that magazine, illustrating his excursion, different moments of the excursion. For six days, he traveled aboard the aptly named Journal de Voyage, stopping in small towns where large audiences listened to his patriotic lectures. This is the same fun view I mentioned earlier, right? On the first leg of the journey, a banker tagged along. As Fonville explained, quote, our intention was to show the rich people of leisure that balloons could be used to make fashionable trips. Thus, the balloons started to be marketed to and appropriated by aristocrats and captains of industry. These men were introduced to ballooning by professionals who made a living off the practice, the manufacturers, entertainers, and scientific aeronauts of yore. But they quickly made it their own. Members of Parisian high society interested in encouraging this new approach to ballooning came together in 1898 to form the Aero Club de France. So it might actually seem paradoxical that elites would appropriate the balloon, an awkward means of transportation at best, in an era marked by its obsession with speed. But speed at this time also went through a process of democratization. For instance, trains, initially the privilege of the wealthy, became more accessible. As distances became shorter, more time became available for people to indulge in leisure, causing the rise of mass tourism. So the balloon became an elitist retreat from the changes ushered forth by this transportation revolution. As one aeronaut explained, balloon offered access to, quote, a corner of the world unknown to locomotives, safe from the insults of the pickaxe and the violations of the trowel. The membership roles of the Aero Club were filled with old aristocratic names, members of financial and political elites, and wealthy industrialists. The club synthesis of, the, the club synthesis of elite sectors helped it overcome the main challenges that had plagued other aeronautical societies. Money. 
In 1900, the club's revenue reached more than 61,500 francs. In comparison, that same year, the country's second most prominent aeronautical association, the French Society for Aerial Navigation I discussed earlier, had barely 6% of them. Aero club members were tireless in their activities, and their obsession with competition became the defining characteristic of turn-of-the-century ballooning. From 1889 to 1914, the club organized no fewer than 145 races. Authorities were concerned about the risks posed by dozens of balloons departing from a high density, high density location. So organizing these events was only possible thanks to the club's financial, social, and political capital. And here you have, uh, so this actually shows the, in white is the number of individual passengers each year going about on a balloon. And actually see that the, there's a slight dip. I mean, stay steady when the airplane first hits the scene, but then it keeps going up significantly. Uh, and this is the number of balloons. And then here you have the red line is hours spent in the air. And the Aero Club tracked all of this in uh, kilometers traveled. And you see that the growth is significant. And the thing is that there were also some major innovations in media going on at the same time that this was all happening. First, there was the rise of the popular press, which had reached new heights with the liberalization of the press in 1881. Just to get an idea, at the turn of the century, each of the four major Parisian newspapers were printing more than one million daily copies. That's each, so four million daily copies total. Um, and that's just four newspapers, right? There, there were the other newspapers, too. Newspapers realized that sports coverage drew readership. So they not only started covering sporting events, but also organizing their own competitions. The most famous example of this kind of stunt is the uh, Tour de France, which was created by the Auto Velo newspaper and exists to this day, right? So the new technology enjoyed by the new prestige enjoyed by ballooning also benefited from changes to the graphic elements in the press. As the technology advanced and became cheaper, photo photographs took the place of hand illustrations. La Vie au Grand Air, perhaps the first modern magazine where the, 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 the goal is to have you flip through the pages and not read through the articles, was especially in innovative, developing new page designs that try to merge form and content. For instance, this montage tries to capture the, the movement of a uh, balloon ascent, right? And it's uh, almost like a kind of cinematic feel to it. And it's worth noting that this is around the same time where the first movie theaters are also appearing. And it wasn't just images of balloons that became more prominent, but also images from balloons. As cameras became more portable, it became easier for aeronauts to take photos of the view from above, a previously inaccessible perspective for most of the population. Representations are important, and all of this played a critical part in making the balloon into one of the key artifacts of fin de siècle modernity, like the bicycle and the automobile. And you see this in this ad, which it, it features racist imagery from the time. Uh, but at the same time, you also see the camera, right? When the, a Kodak camera in the balloon, a Kodak camera in the bicycle, a Kodak camera in the train. Everyone can have a Kodak, right? So the interest in ballooning, and in ballooning in Paris in particular, went beyond France. With the advent of the telegraph, the popular press became increasingly transatlantic in its nature. Readers in New York were eager for news from Paris, and those in Paris were, well, somewhat interested in news from New York. The New York Herald, the same newspaper that helped finance Stanley's exp expedition to find uh, David Livingston in Africa, was the best example of this phenomenon. It even had a Paris edition, and its owner had, was a vigorous promoter of aeronautical pursuits, creating the Gordon Bennett International Balloon Race in 1906. And another important figure in the fashion of ballooning as a symbol of modernity was the Brazilian-born aeronaut Alberto Santos Dumont, the first global aeronautical celebrity. He moved to Paris in the 1890s and was quickly adopted by Parisians as one of their own. They affectionately called him Le Petit Santos, Little Santos. Already famous for his risky ascents, he became even more of a celebrity once he started working on his airships. Thanks to, the thanks to developments in the automobile industry, engines had become powerful enough to steer airships against the wind. And Santos Dumont marveled Paris and the world with his flights around the Eiffel Tower, itself a monument designed with aeronautical aspirations. 
The Herald, in particular, was interested in Santos Dumont's exploits, and its vivid and imaginative illustrations of his flights helped readers feel as if they were first-row spectators in the making of a new modern world full of technological marvels. Images of Santos Dumont and of his airship rounding the Eiffel Tower appeared everywhere, from toys to cigarette trading cards. And yeah, so this is an uh, example of one of the Herald illustrations. And here you have Santos Dumont in a variety of settings, right? A cigarette trading card that I bought on eBay, uh, a post uh, caricature on Vanity Fair, where all the famous people were caricatured. And here it's at a toy competition, where the most popular toy was Santos Dumont style toys. And you see the Eiffel Tower and the dirigible. So I'm, I'm a little over time, so I'm going to end here. A far cry from De La Man's balloon and Manet's lith lith lithograph, right? After all, soon enough, the balloon would be overshadowed by something else, the airplane, which became the quintessential symbol for modern transportation. I guess it is to this day, right? But who knows? Progress is not linear. Technologies submerge and reemerge. Or should I say, descend and ascend? Thank you. I, we have time for a few questions. I'll come by with the microphone if you want to raise your hand. We want to be sure to get the audio on our live stream. And also, before I forget, uh, at the conclusion of today's program, please join us across the hall in the History of Science reading room. Uh, there are uh, a handful of books that Patrick had uh, shown the illustrations from. They'll be on display over there, and you'll get a chance to um, chat with Patrick some more. So. Any questions, please? Thanks. In uh, in World War One, the the balloons were used for observation and actually, I think, to try to take down uh, regular heavier than aircraft, weren't they? They had cables or something to try to. Mm -hmm. um, were they ever actually used offensively in? Well, offensively, the the greatest example is the Zeppelin, right? Uh, there would be Zeppelin raids over London, and even though they were actually less efficient in, in causing damage and more efficient at causing panic. Uh, and that's, that's significant in its own way, right? Um, panic being a, a useful strategy during wars. But yeah, the Zeppelin, the French had their own offensive dirigibles. They weren't hard uh, cased dirigibles like the Zeppelin. They were soft. Um, and they were used to limited, they were mostly used for scouting in part because airplanes uh, in World War I had limited range, and dirigibles had significantly longer range. So. Any other questions? Don't be shy. All right. All right, yes, sir. If you want any, any detail about any of the illustrations, I'm happy to do that, too. So. Well, in the development of the uh, balloons, one of the key issues was how to provide the gas that they used, the hydrogen, and when they used hydrogen. Mm -hmm. And before they got into warm air, you didn't touch on that much in your discussion there. Yes, yeah, so the first balloon was hot air, the Montgolfier, and they're still known in France as Montgolfiers. But they started using hydrogen, too. And uh, the thing is, hydrogen was much more efficient for the kind of long ascent that they were doing. Uh, the thing is, hydrogen was really expensive to make. Yes. <laughs> um, but so what they ended up using throughout much of the 19th century was actually the, the, the gas used for lighting across the city, uh, coal gas. And also risky, but cheaper than hydrogen. You don't stay afloat as much. Uh, and that's why actually a lot of the, the scientific ascents took place from the coal gas industries in the outskirts of Paris. And then when the Aero Club formed, they realized, actually, this is very shabby. We can't have our parties uh, here in the gas industries. So they, they, they constructed their own little club at, um, at uh, saint Cloud, which used to be this like private noble estate. And it's there to this day. Um, it's where, I don't think it's, it's trendy anymore, but it was trendy back in the day. It's where all the posh people go. Um, so yeah, gas. Has, has been, and now again, 
Uh, so if you're doing any kind of scientific ascent, or, or the people who do the sort of like extreme ballooning, um, <clears throat> so like there's some people who have gone a, uh, around the world in a balloon, like in a Jules Verne kind of way, or high altitude ascents, those are, those are not hot air balloons, those are, are gas balloons, because hot air balloon, um, it has only a limited, a very limited amount of time. But if you're doing a touristy ascent, like in, in uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico, or in uh, Cappadocia is a place, too, where, where it's really popular. Those are all hot air balloons. And that was something that re-emerged as a tourist industry in the 1950s and 1960s. Yeah, I'll come by at the microphone. Yes. Could you explain um, how they figured out how to steer it and when that was, when they, what year they finally figured that out? Mm -hmm. So there's not really a clear date. So what happens is that the, there are developments in engines, right? So um, first they they have uh, they they try to do it with sort of uh, uh, steam engines. And the thing is, steam en engines are very heavy, uh, and you need water to cool them down and all that. A lot of water. Um, so that didn't work that well. It's only when they once they they developed a combustion engine. Uh, that things really start working, and that's around the 1900, like 1900, uh, in part because there's all this stuff going on with the automobile industry, where Paris is also a center for that, with with Renault and and Peugeot and all these 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 guys. Um, and what's seen as kind of like the, although there had been examples of ballooning steering against the wind before, what's seen as like the sort of major moment is when Santos Dumont. In 19, I think it's 1901, he flies his dirigible, his airship, around the Eiffel Tower and back in a set amount of time. And because he did it in a set amount of time, because there are all these, these sort of rules, the rules help give it legitimacy, right? So, oh, we can do it now, even though his airship is still very, uh, not that safe at this point. Um, and after that, you start, like, things really start picking up with the technology. All right, thank you, Patrick, for a wonderful lecture. Thank you.